Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. A uh, little bit of a Halloween presentation here. I'm going to be talking about things that are sub-varieties of Bigfoot. And in this case, things that you absolutely never want to run into. Um, almost all the information I'll be giving you guys in my presentation can be found in the following books. Bigfoot, True Story of Apes in America by Lauren Coleman. True Giants, his Gigantopithecus Stolabod, also by my friend Lauren Coleman and her co-author Mark A. Hall. <coughs> Excuse me, Giants, Monsters, and Cannibals by Kathy Muscovitz Stream. And The Historical Bigfoot by Chad Arment. In case you'd like to read the longer versions of any of the reports I'll be referencing, and I also apologize for any technical problems, which I've been having for days and are continuing another computer at this point. So, <clears throat> I'm unfortunately unable to show you two excellent photos of Mount Giant tracks that I've gathered for you. One from the East Coast and one from right from Montana. Although, do I have I do have one of the other tracks from Montana photograph. So, anyway, today I'd like to talk to you about two relatives of Sasquatch, or one prototype and one possible entirely different mystery hominid. The best of all, they're not from an African jungle, a Tibetan mountain valley, or any far off locale. In fact, these beings are from right here in North America. Reports of them and their tracks are still coming in to this day. And also in keeping with the season, as I said before, these both qualify as monsters by our human standards. Whoops, I'm blocking the screen, I'm sorry. And are things that uh, no sane human would ever want to see. In fact, if you do see them, it might be the last thing that you ever do see. Well, in the background right now, we've got uh, Dread Fun doing an illustration of one of the things that I'm talking about. There have already been sightings of one of the types of creatures that I'm going to be talking about here on at least the two occasions right here in Montana. And uh, we really like to think of ourselves as solidly atop the food chain. And anyone who's been stalked by a mountain lion or bear can tell you how creepy that feeling is when something is watching you with the intent of making you their next meal. Your pulse races, you break out in a cold sweat, the hair on the back of your neck stands up, and your stomach is filled with a mass of lead that wants out. These are all signs from your subconscious that you are about to become someone's happy meal. I don't believe they can turn invisible, project force fields, fly, or shine light out of their eyes, red or any other color. Bigfoot's eyes do not project light. Bigfoot does not have six ever ready D cell batteries up his butt, as Bear would like to say. Eye shine is simple reflectivity from a source, and that source determines the eye shine color. The one that I saw in the dark in the driveway at my house was about 20 feet away from me, and he had a pale green glow into his eyes because it was from the floodlight that he was reflecting on our porch, and not because he had green gels in front of his Bigfoot headlights. Usually the color reported is red, by the way, and this is, however, not a joke and not misidentification. Some of these following reports have been the subject of confusion and even embarrassment amongst the top researchers who could not get either one of these pegs to fit into a Bigfoot-shaped hole. The behavior and descriptions of these creatures simply do not fit within the known parameters of collected Bigfoot data. And so often they were ignored or ridiculed as preposterous or brushed off as hoaxes. Oh, I wish that was true. I very much wish I had never seen one and could be a simple, bemused skeptic about it, but I have seen one in broad daylight at about 40 feet. And uh, let's just say, part of the problem with seeing this thing is that I didn't see a regular Sasquatch, or a Sassy, which is my slang for Sasquatch. What I saw was Sassy's bald, tempered, carnivorous cousin, Wendy. And yes, Wendy likes their meals hot and juicy just like the commercials used to say. In fact, all the subspecies that uh, we know of, we have slang terms for them, so we can talk about it in public without drawing too much attention to our conversation. So we have names like Sassy, Wendy, or Jim, Stanky, Boogie, Babs, and Biggie, which is Sasquatch, Wendigo, or Genosclus, Skunk Ape, Wood, Dover, Baboon, Muscle, Tech, Bigfoot, and Mountain Giants. And now you know the secret words. Welcome to the world of Bigfoot Intelligentsia. Michael Cook will show you guys all the secret handshake on the way out. But seriously, uh, it only stands to reason that different climates, flora, and fauna would yield some regional variations. 
I know there's over a dozen regional sub varieties of deer just right here in the lower 48. So we accept Bigfoot as a reality, expecting one from Maine to be the same as one from Oregon, Texas, or Florida is really kind of foolish. It also seems that regional variants exist in some areas with other variants nearby. So if local population, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if they were breeding between them, these sub varieties would cease to exist and the local populations would have become homogenous a long time ago. But instead, what we seem to find from collected reports of this show the opposite to be true. Um, sort of like an area where you might have black tail, white tail, mule deer, elk, all in the same area. They're not breeding with each other. Um, and no, I don't think that dogmen or those werewolf things that are reported are in the Bigfoot category. In fact, I'll bet every penny that I have that Bigfoot and pooch deer are completely unrelated. And now that bipedal canids are out of the picture, let's get back to Wendy, shall we? When I first heard of the patterson Gimlin film, I thought, well, great, someone's got some video of the thing I saw finally. Well, well, the hair was too short, and it was the wrong color, and the face was very different, and it didn't have claws, and the body shape was wrong, and it was the wrong gender. Other than those tiny discrepancies, an exact match. Needless to say, rather than feeling validated by the film, I was more confused than ever. And after a while, it occurred to me that since these things were real, the native people must know about them. And so I began to look for knowledge of that from the natives, and secondarily from old news articles on wild men, Yahoo's escape gorillas, mountain giants, and whatever else they had managed to gather from the 1700s and 1800s, figuring once again, if these things were real, somebody had to have seen them, they had to have been reported at some point. Well, here's what I found. Nearly every tribe has a name for Bigfoot. Many of them have rather unpleasant meanings. Some of these tribes have two or more names for Bigfoot as well. Why should they have two or more names for the same thing? Now, even if you eliminate such things as gender-specific names like wild man versus wild woman, there's still at least 22 of the 32 tribes known to me which have these duplicated names. Some of them have up to eight. Um, and it seems at first redundant, but then when you begin to look at them and what the actual meanings of these names are, they start to seem to convey different behaviors, and I believe they're talking about completely different independent sub-varieties of the Bigfoot type being being seen in the same area. Keep in mind now that we cannot simply cherry pick this information or main objective. We cannot on the one hand say, oh, the natives knew about Bigfoot. They all have a name for it. And then on the other hand, dismiss the notion that there may be more than one type being described when a given tribe has a name for two or more things, which we assume all mean Bigfoot. In the region between the western end of the Great Lakes and the east coast and extending north into the Arctic, the stories of a Bigfoot-like creature have a very disturbing and violent side to them. Clearly, the range of this creature may have extended as far south as eastern Oklahoma in recent times and may still exist in mountainous regions to the north of there. Psychology has a term drawn from this in Legends of the Cree, which has been called the Wendigo Psychosis, a clinical term denoting cannibalism brought on by long-term isolation, usually cabin fever, in which the crazed person eats other people nearby, even if other food is available. This, however, is not what the natives in that area were describing. Let's take a quick look at the names for Bigfoot of some of the tribes in this area, shall we? The Cree call this creature Wetico, from whence we first find this name. The Tepdipole call it Wetico, and the Eastern Athabascan call it Wendago, which means wicked cannibal. In fact, throughout the area, there's a belief in a very dangerous humanoid creature with what we would consider to be revolting habits, inhabiting the forest of the Northeast. The Algonquin linguistic group from the East, Upper Midwest, and Lower Canada uses the following names, Windigo, Wendigo, Weetiko, Wetico, Winico, Wendigoag, and other similar sounding names to describe these wicked cannibal giants. They're all described as very tall, fully hair covered, and in this case, including the face, very elusive and predominantly too fully carnivorous. They're supposed to be gray in color, 
leaning toward white in the winter, and that could simply be the result of snow building up on their rather long fur coats, which are, you know, six or eight inch long hair during the winter, um, rather than maybe them having a shorter summer coat and a longer white winter coat like the rabbits and weasels in the area do. Don't know. In any case, a casual practice among writers and researchers is to refer to the eastern Bigfoot as Wendigo. R.S. Lambert, a Canadian, says that the Wendigo is, quote, a Canadian entity, half phantom, half beast, who lives in the forest and preys on human beings, particularly children. The belief in this horror dates back to the earliest Indian legends, and it is said the Wendigo will eat the flesh of its victims, unquote. One account from the 1800s on the area of the Ojibwa, which is where I used to live, tells us of the Muskegos who inhabited the low and cheerless swamps on the borders of Hudson's Bay, who are reproached by other tribes as cannibals. But they themselves claim it is the others that they live in constant fear of, the Wendigog. According to the Reverend Joseph Guinard in his article, Wittico Among the Tete du Belay, quote, the Wittigo wore no clothes. Summer and winter he went naked and never suffered from cold. His skin was black like that of a negro. He would rub himself like the animals against fir, spruce, and other resinous trees. When he was thus covered with gum resin, he would go and roll in the sand and rocks, so that one would have thought, after many operations of this kind, he was made of stone. The voice of the Wendigo is strident and frightful and more reverberating than thunder. He is a huge individual who goes naked in the bush and eats Indians." Unquote. Similar behavior and applique arbor installation is also ascribed to the Pasmaquoddy Chinoo who would rub themselves all over with fur balsam and then roll themselves on the ground so that everything adhered to the body. This habit is highly suggestive of the Iroquoian stone coats, are also known as stone giants. Bloodthirsty cannibal giants who used to cover their bodies carefully with pitch, and then roll and wallow in sand and down sandbanks, according to John Cooper in the Cree Wetco Psychosis. The Shinuru of the Micmac, Wittico of the Cree, of the Cree excuse me, and Stone Coats of the Iroquois all seem to be a description of the same horror. In the forest of Maine, the Penobscot tell the Kiwakue, again a cannibal giant. C.M. Barbeau, when recording legends of the Huron and Wyandotte around the Huron, uh, Lake Huron says that the Wyandots most averred enemy was the Strendu, who were dreaded on account of their extraordinary size and power. Some descriptions have these beings half a tree tall and large in proportion. Their bodies were covered all over in flinty scales, which made them almost invulnerable. According to Hartley Burr Alexander in Mythology of All Races, the Iroquoian stone giants of New York as well as similar beings among the Algonquin belong to a widespread group of mystic, oh, excuse me, mythic beings, of which the Eskimo Tornit is another example. They are huge in stature, unacquainted with a bow, and employing stones for weapons. In awesome combat, they fight one another, uprooting the tallest trees for weapons and rending the earth in fury. Commonly.